Welcome everyone to the SF Bay Area School Counselors and Education Professionals Meetup Group. I would like to welcome our speakers, Dr. Jennifer McMahon and Mr. Va Tan, and their presentation called Toxic Stress and School Influence Factors, Lessons from Cambodia. Our meetup group is sponsored by Council Hero. Council Hero is trying to change our school and college counseling as we know it by building a complete end-to-end -end system that automates many of the tasks counselors are asked to do in schools. This will free up counselors to spend more time with their students and impact their lives. One counselor in a school can have as many as a thousand cases of students, but Council Hero makes it possible to serve all of these with a combination of AI and social emotional learning tests. So go check it out at councilhero.com. With over 20 years of experience that ranges from teaching pre-K through adult learners, Dr. McMahon is committed to using her background and education to make a difference in the world. Dr. Jennifer McMahon is the Director of Learning from Livonia Central School District in New York State and the founder of Teacher Leader Academy, a program to help empower Cambodian teachers. Hailing from Phnom Penh, Cambodia, Mr. Tan is a graduate student at the New Generation Pedagogical Research Center. Social emotional learning within the school setting is not a part of most Cambodian schools. So Mr. Tan's work will open the door for deeper conversations around the importance of equipping students with these skills. Together, Tan and McMahon will illustrate how educators can make a difference to impact toxic stress within their students and how they give students the tools to build agency and restore hope. We are really excited to have them. And please now give your full attention to Dr. Jennifer McMahon and Mr. Va Tan. Thank you so much for that really warm introduction. My name is Jen McMahon and I am the director of the Livonia Central School District, the director of learning for Livonia Central School District, which is in New York State, just right outside of Rochester, New York. And I'm also the director of the Teacher Leader Academy, which had its start in Simrit, Cambodia. And I am just so delighted to be joined today by my colleague, um, Mr. Va Tan. He, as um, was introduced earlier, he is a graduate student at the New Generation Pedagogical Research Center in Phnom Penh, Cambodia, and he is also our um, advisor for the Teacher Leader Academy. So um, I'm just especially grateful because it is about two o'clock in the morning in Cambodia right now. So please join me in saying good morning to, um, to Teacher Va. Good morning, Teacher Va. Morning from Cambodia. Hmm. So um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and we'll get started. So um, our topic today is toxic stress and school influence factors lessons from Cambodia. So we just wanted to share maybe just a little bit more about us. But first of all, we want to say welcome and thank you so much for joining us. It is such a privilege and a pleasure to, to be with you today and to talk about this topic and share with you. Um, so just a little bit more about the Teacher Leader Academy. It was originally created about two years ago as a way to bring some professional learning to teachers that were teaching in a floating village in uh, just outside of, of Sibirat, Cambodia. Um, they're located on the Tonlesap River. And these teachers, about half of them have completed a two-year teacher training program, like at a provincial teacher training college. And about half of them have a high school education. So our goal was to empower them and to provide some professional learning experiences. Um, and we started that with a teacher institute and then sort of some of them sort of self-selected and felt that they really wanted something more. So that's how the Teacher Leader Academy was born. We really focused on um, kind of raising them up as mentors and as teacher leaders. But what we're really excited to share with you is that just recently, we have been able to kind of transform the Teacher Leader Academy into a bachelor's degree program. So we're gonna be launching our bachelor's degree program very soon through the University of Applied Research and Development in New Zealand. And um, what I'm super excited about is that it's fully crowdsourced. So I have been able to um, find enough colleagues and friends who have expertise in various fields who are going to de dedicate and donate their time and expertise to help us really create a robust bachelor's degree program, but at very, very low cost for our Cambodian teachers. So, very excited to share that with you. 
if it is something that um, speaks to you and it's something where you feel like you maybe want to help make a difference, please reach out to us. We're always looking for content creators and people who are willing to share their expertise. Um, so just a quick plug before we get started with that. But um, now that we've shared a little bit about us, we would really like to know more about you. Yeah, so first of all, I'd like to know where you're from and what brings you here today, and also what are you wondering about today? So thank you. So please uh, find your chat box and share with us, as um, Va teacher Va has, has asked, um, where are you from? And just what are you wondering about? So as you fill the chat with uh, some of your thinking um, and perhaps, so please feel free to continue to introduce yourself. Sometimes it takes a little while for the chat box to fill, but it looks like we have people joining us from California and from Texas and people are interested in learning more about experiences in education around the world. We have high school counselors, we have people from Jordan, um, from Canada, welcome everyone. We're so excited that you're here with us today. Mm, and people are interested in how do you create a positive environment for children? How do we, how do different people, people in different cultures deal with toxicity in education? Wonderful. Thank you so much for all of you joining us today. So please continue to fill your, fill the chat but we'll move forward and introduce our agenda and some of our talking points for today. Yeah, so today agenda we're talking about what? So sorry. <laughs> yes, so today agenda we're talking about uh, what is toxin stress and what are common stressors in Cambodia? Uh, what are the school influence factors? Uh, which of these uh, evidence in Cambodia, what lesson can be learned? And the last one is how do the school influence factors uh, connect to the casual framework? So all of these are our agenda that we are talking about today. Thank you so much. Yes, so we'll begin with just kind of what is toxic stress? So um, it looks like just looking in the chat, many of you are coming um, from wide variety of background in education. We have a lot of counselors here and some uh, assistant superintendents and superintendents. And so toxic stress is definitely um, kind of a hot topic, especially in the United States. So um, we'll just kind of have a quick overview of, of what we mean when we're talking about toxic stress. So toxic stress is when a stress response becomes extreme and long lasting in the absence of protective relationships. So stress by itself is not necessarily bad, for children, it can be positive and a way to build resilience when it's something minor. So maybe like um, the first day with a new teacher or trying something new for the first time. That will certainly um, elicit a stress response. There could be a brief increase in heart rate or maybe a mild increase in those stress hormone levels, but then it's over. And especially if you have a caring adult there to kind of walk you through it, um, sometimes there's often a sense of accomplishment. So that's a, it's a positive stress reaction. So then um, there is also tolerable stress. So this is when maybe there are significant stressors such as a, the loss of a loved one or a serious accident or injury, maybe parent loss of a job or illness. And these are usually temporary but as long as there are protective factors, as long as there is a, a strong adult caring relationship for, for children, then usually um, this is a significant stressor, but you can kind of, they can um, kind of get through this without any significant damage. So when we're talking about toxic stress, this is when those either those really significant things become kind of chronic or ongoing, um, or they're happening even, even, even minor stresses are happening, but without that adult protective buffer. And so it's one of those situations where um, if it's ongoing and it's happening without that adult support, then it can lead to physical and um, long-term physical issues as well as things that you may see in the classroom. 
like students with learning issues or perhaps um, beyond learning difficulties, they, there may be behaviors that you see in the classroom, there may be impulsive behaviors, all of these kinds of things can be because of toxic stress. And so there is a lot of research. Um, I recommend the developing child at harvard.edu has tons of information if you're interested in learning more about toxic stress. Um, but for some big stressors, for example, that may, may show that they don't have that parental support um, would be things like physical and mental abuse, chronic neglect, uh, lack of access to basic needs, maybe substance abuse or mental illness with the adults in the family, and these kinds of stressors that are ongoing and happening in the absence of a supportive adult relationship. So long-term effects though, things like um, heart disease, diabetes, substance abuse, and depression, that's all been shown by research that children who have these adverse childhood experiences but without the protective factor of an adult there to kind of walk them through it or to give them that loving, caring relationship, then that can be a very um, long-term detrimental effect of toxic stress. So what are some common stressors that you see in your context? We'd love for you to just pop into the chat what you see with, in your own students or in the students that, or children that you may work with. Mm. Absolutely. So right now, I think, well, it's really around the world, right? Um, COVID-19 is an, is an experience that is causing so much stress for families, for teachers, for students. Um, if, if they've been directly impacted with loss of a family member, all of these can be causing a lot of, of stress in many of our lives. Yes, absolutely. So we see crime, mm -hmm. systemic inequalities in education, absolutely. Mm. The experience of online learning, food insecurity for sure, yeah. And with, with COVID right now, um, so in the United States, we have been experiencing this COVID pandemic for the last year. Um, in Cambodia, they really only recently have had that community spread. And so um, their schools are now closed. But um, up until this point, although they did have some school closures, they weren't experiencing the, the fear that comes with COVID necessarily because they, they just didn't have a widespread amount of COVID in Cambodia. But very recently, just in the last few weeks, they've had community spread. And so now it's they're kind of dealing with that first wave that many of us. So let's see what other people are saying here. Um, poverty, yes, the effects of systemic racism, parental inc incarceration, yes, all of these, illness, death, drug use, addiction. Thank you so much for sharing those. So we'd like to now just talk a little bit about some of the common stressors in Cambodia. So um, teacher Va, would you share with us just some of the things that your students face in Cambodia? Thank you so much, doctor. So this is based on my experience. You know, I, I found that some of my students, they, uh, they have like, they have stress also like, you know, some students, they live with their relatives or some they live in Pagoda, you know, to, to make sure that they get a set to school because their parents working far from their homes. Like some parents, they uh, migrate to Thailand, you know, to work in Thailand, which is one country nearby Cambodia. And also another is uh, like uh, food insecurity. Yes, that one also a problem or uh, a stress uh, a stressor in Cambodia because you know some students they don't have like hygiene food or enough food to eat. Yeah. Also physical and mental abuse. Yes, this still happen in Cambodia especially with the student in the countryside, you know, because uh, the parents still use like the state method to, 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 to educate their children because they believe that uh, the state method is something that can educate their children, okay? And another one is uh, lack of money for uh, uniform or study material. This is very common in the Cambodian school, especially in countryside again. So some students, they go to school, you know, without uniform or, uh, I mean, they, 
they very close, but you know, that is not a properly uniform for school because in Cambodia like you could see in the pictures, we have proper uniform to go to school. Also, uh, some students, they don't have the material for studying, okay? Another one is uh, lack of access to the healthcare. This has happened to, you know, it, it happened to a Cambodian student, especially, you know, for kids. Example, like when one kid uh, got too sight, they don't go to dentist at all. They just keep paying, you know, to release by itself. So this is very common in Cambodia, yes. And also I experienced this with my student as well. Another one is illness and family days, yes. Like some of my students, they, you know, like their parents pass away and they have to stay with uh, or live with their relative or auntie to make sure that they, they get access to school. Yes, so this are uh, very common in Cambodia. Thank you. Mm. And so one of the things to sort of just draw your attention to with the Cambodian context is that with their recent history, um, so the, the adults in this country, the majority of them have experienced trauma and tragedy. So um, the older adults have survived and lived through Khmer Rouge, and the younger adults, many of them grew up during civil war or were born right at the end of civil war. And so you have kind of this whole population of adults who even if they are present, um, so as teacher Vaz shared, you know, some of them are leaving to go get work. Some of them are um, unable to care for children because of illness or perhaps um, they're, they, um, may have other reasons that they're not able to directly take care of their children. But in addition to that, we have kind of this whole adult population that has been experiencing trauma. And so they may not have the skill set or the personal capacity to be able to offer that really caring and loving relationship that we know is a protective factor for helping students or children. Um, who may be experiencing stress or toxic stress. They're, they're dealing with their own um, effects of toxic stress in many cases. So I think that's really important just to keep that. Um, the other piece here is that many of the examples that teacher Va has shared, these are not just sort of um, a minority of the students, but many of his students are experiencing these kinds of stressors in their daily life. So I wanna talk now about what we mean by the school influence factors. And so first of all, this research, um, the research on resiliency is really clear that there are things that can be done to kind of balance the scales of toxic stress or to balance the scales so that stressors don't become toxic. And there are things that parents can do and there are things that schools can do. Um, so I'm drawing from research in, um, by Kenneth Ginsberg. Dr. Ginsberg is a pediatrician and he wrote a book called uh, Building Resilience in Children and Teens, Giving Kids Roots and Wings. And what he's done is he's taking the resiliency research and made it really easy to remember by calling them the seven C's. He um, is drawing upon, I think there's, a, he's drawing upon something that was the five C's originally, but then he's sort of expanded that to be the seven C's. And he's given each of these um, resiliency factors a very easy to remember name. Um, but his book is really focused on things that parents can do. So we're drawing from that and calling these the school influence factors in terms of what can educators do, what can schools do to try to make a difference for students. So the first one is connection. And so that's so clear in all the research that if in the absence of a parent connection, that another caring adult can really help make a difference for students. And so teachers who take the time and educators and counselors and principals who take the time to really get to know their students and connect with them, that that can make a very significant difference. The next thing that um, Dr. Ginsburg talks about is coping strategies. So in schools these days, we often have um, social emotional learning programs 
or we have opportunities, um, whether it's through physical education or health class, for students to start to understand themselves a bit and to also learn how they might more positively cope with stress. So in New York State, we have the New York State Mental Health Initiative, which requires that school districts provide mental health education for students. Um, so in my district, we have been really uh, focusing on how we can help students. We teach them things like um, mindfulness and deep breathing and how to uh, cope with disappointment. And all of this is kind of built into our school day now. Um, so that's one of the C's is coping. The next is control, which is basically agency. It's helping students see that their choices make a difference and that their current reality doesn't have to be their future. And so helping them feel like they have control over daily situations is one way that we can help. Um, something as simple as offering choice. Do you want the assignment to be due Thursday or Friday? Um, do you want to um, do this assignment as a research paper or a presentation? These are simple things that we can do, but they do make a difference for students. The next is contribution. It's the idea of giving to others um, and to helping to make a difference in the world. And so when we can offer students these opportunities where they can see beyond themselves, it truly is a way that we can help reduce stress. I know even as adults that when I feel like I am helping others or making a difference, it does help, it soothes my heart. So um, it makes sense that when we do the help students do this, that it helps them as well. And then of course, competence. I think one of the main things that schools can do is make sure that we are providing students with very strong foundational skills, very strong educational background so that they can then move on and, and have deeper learning. Um, this is also a way that we address equity, that when we provide really strong um, foundational skill work for all students, that then we can help them all grow in um, academics. And of course, in hand, in hand in hand with competence is confidence, that when students feel competent, when they can read and write and do mathematics, they often will feel confident as well. And finally, character. And I think that um, this is also something that we're seeing in our schools, at least in the United States right now, is some sort of character education, usually um, part of a social emotional learning program. So these are kind of a broad stroke of what we would call the school influence factors. And now what I'd like to do is really just kind of go into a little bit more detail about which of these we see in Cambodia. And in particular, the way that they were sort of manifested. Um, so I had the opportunity to observe classrooms when I was in Cambodia and um, share some amazing experiences with our Teacher Leader Academy members, including um, Teacher Va here. So some of the main ones that we see in Cambodia that I feel that we can really learn from. Control, um, the way that they establish and help students have hope for their future. Competence, helping them focus on those foundational skills. Contribution, finding ways for students to give back and feel part of their school community. And finally, connection, that warm and caring relationship. And now we're gonna just kind of dig in just a little bit more so you can hear some specific examples. So control. Um, is that idea of developing agency or a sense that students can have a different future than their present. So teacher Va, um, what are some ways that you have students and help them, I'm sorry, that you help your students develop hope for their future? Thank you so much, doctor. So based on my experience, you know, when, uh, when I work with kids, you know, at first, you know, I, I have to introduce myself first. So this is seem like the best chance ever, you know, to to make sure that what we say to them is, you know, a kind of inspiration to them. So when they listen, they can see, oh, this teacher is from, you know, a, a, a hardship background like us, and he can change his life. So for example, I could introduce uh, them about myself, like uh, I respond in the jungle, and also 
you could see me now. How how could I grow up and how can I be a teacher? So I went to Cyprus one in jungles and I went to school with you know surrounded with landmines. And on the way to school, it just you know it it, it has the landmines on the way. So it's really dangerous during that time. But I still change you know something that uh, to make sure that I have today to make sure that I have a job to to do and to make sure that I get higher education. Another example, I could example about myself again, like uh, recently about uh, four years ago, you know, uh, I, I had to, uh, to go to university, you know, uh, about like uh, 100 kilometers from my house. So I have to drive a little by, you know, about 200 kilometers per day. So that is something that I have to, uh, to do to, 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 to get uh, to reach my goal. And when I told this to my students, they really feel like, wow, teachers, I want to be some, uh, this is like a good example for, for me to, to learn about you. And it, this is very encouraged me, you know, to, to, to make sure that uh, I, uh, in the future, uh, student can, you know, can, can make the life to change, to be the better life. For example, like in these pictures, it is from the floating uh, village. So you could see the student, they study in this floating school and they, they want to see, you know, something change in their lives in the future. So it kind of uh, telling a story about someone or about myself, especially to them, it's a kind of inspiration and it's a kind of uh, make them to, you know, to have hope in their lives in the future. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I was personally very inspired by Teacher Va's story about when he wanted to go to high school and they did not have a high school near his home. And so he had to uh, live with relatives far away and he would wake up very, very early in the morning and um, have to help prepare the meal. So um, what time did you wake up, Teacher Va? Well, mostly I wake up at her at uh, 4 a.m. in the morning and I have to prepare food for the family and after that you know I could practice English at the same time actually during that time yes <laughs> so he'd get up early and practice his English while he was chopping his vegetables and our other teacher leader academy members mm -hmm. have shared very similar stories um, one of them desperately wanted to go to high school but his family just could not afford uh, for him to be gone to high school they really needed him to stay um, but he really wanted to, so he became a monk. And he told me that while he was a monk, he was 14 years old when he started to become a monk, um, that he would get one meal per day. It was whatever people put in his bowl. He had to eat just that. You can't cook it or do anything different with it. You just eat what people give you. So you can meet, eat one time per day. And of course, um, when times were kind of difficult, sometimes the bowl would not be very full. And so he told me though, that he would feel that hunger in his stomach and he, in his head would change that to hunger for learning. Um, so I was very inspired by him as well. Um, one of our other teacher leader academy members wanted to go to high school. Again, the family couldn't afford it. Um, so he um, started to catch rats in their field and sell them so that he could afford to attend high school. So, so many different inspiring stories. And the idea though, is that as students see that people who came from very similar backgrounds are rising up and able to overcome many of their challenges, that this is a, a way for them to feel that there is hope and control perhaps in their future as well. So the next one that I was very impressed with and felt that, that um, they have many different examples of how they help their students and give them opportunities for contribution. So Teacher Va, can you talk a little bit about contribution? Thank you so much, Doctor. So if we talk about uh, contribution, you know, in Cambodia, especially in school, can, uh, in the school in Cambodia, uh, first, you can see in this picture, you could see, you know, students, they see a boat, you know, they go to school together because, you know, floating village, students have to go to school by boat. So some family, they might not have boat, and some family they have food. So this little kid, they just see a boat together, you know, to get access to school. So this is what they are doing now in the floating village. And back to my experience, you know, because uh, I teach a student in 
actually I teach in Sindri province, which is not in on the lakes like this one. So I could see my student, they see the, you know, they, they see a thing to their friend, especially like during break time, they contribute some meal or some snack to their friends. Also, uh, those students who, you know, who master in curriculum, they try to help those who are not really master in curriculum. So they start to help each other, you know, it, this is the kinds of contribution in the, in, in, in the school in Cambodia, yes. Yeah, so from an outside perspective, when I was there and observing, I was just so impressed by the way that the teachers would kind of set up the opportunities for students to help one another. And it was just very natural and part of the culture for everyone to kind of pitch in and feel like they were taking care of the classroom, taking care of one another. Um, they would clean the classroom. Um, the teachers will come in and, and clean the school um, and help keep it um, looking nice and in repair. Um, even the bridge, there was a picture earlier um, of the, the bridge that they use that goes from one, um, one school to the other. That bridge is also in the floating village, the teachers help build that. So the director um, kind of takes main control of it and then the teachers also assist. So, um, and then also sometimes students help as well. So just so many examples of how they, even students who may not seem like they have a lot um, at least from a socioeconomic perspective, they are able to still really give and to make a difference. And I think that uh, contribution is just so key and so important. So then we move to competence. And so um, this uh, slide has two pictures to kind of illustrate what we mean by that. So competence in an academic setting is a way to kind of help balance those toxic stress scales. In particular, as we talked about before, focusing on foundational skills really helps students um, gain that ability to continue to grow as learners. So in this picture uh, over on this, this side, you'll see that um, there is one of our Teacher Leader Academy members and he has a boat and in the boat, there are some bookshelves and there are several boxes. And what's contained in that, those boxes are higher level textbooks, and um, math and science materials. So the teachers in the floating village got together and really felt that they, they didn't feel that what they were doing was really preparing students well enough if they did get the opportunity to go to high school. And so they worked together, um, we did some fundraising and they were able to then purchase some additional materials so that they can help their ninth grade students become even more prepared so that if they have the opportunity to go to high school, that they're able to do that. So just as a side note, um, as we've been saying, it, it's not a given that students can go to high school. In the floating village, they don't have a high school. So you're really, your only opportunity is if you leave your family and you stay um, usually with a relative um, in one of the cities where they have a high school. So, um, so this is for students that have that hope of being able to go to high school and then they're just, the teachers are working extra hard so that they can make sure that they're really prepared for that. And then the other picture is actually Teacher Va and one of his lovely students. Do you wanna share just a little bit about what's happening? Mm. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, I taught, uh, I taught in fifth grade and this one is, you know, uh, the kid that are uh, presenting is his reporting his uh, his work you know after he he works about like 10 minutes and then he came to he came to the the front and you know he presented his or he, he report his work to the whole class so i would like to talk about this as well this is uh the way that you know most teachers in Cambodia do because uh, the class in Cambodia is light so once one completes uh, when one to uh, works on something and then they have to present and when, when they go to present they, they can go to in or uh, in front of the blackboard or whiteboard you know to present their work and other students they can focus on that as well yes so about these pictures it was about my student who uh reporting his work to the class thank you mm. yes thank you so much so um competence is definitely something that I saw very different ways that teachers were continually focusing on 
trying to help students become as strong as possible academically. Um, and, you know, teacher Va in particular, when I was there, he had some students that were struggling readers. Um, they were fifth graders and they still didn't have their foundational skills in place fully. And so I observed as teacher Va um, brought them in during their break times and working with them after school and in many different times, sending them uh, Facebook messages, whatever it took to really help students um, master those foundational skills. So competence was definitely something that we saw a lot in Cambodia. And uh, um, so the last one, and this is where I, I think that we can all learn lessons from the teachers in Cambodia. It's this idea of connection. And so as we had shared before, sometimes the parent impact or the, the parents are not able to provide that loving, caring relationship. But in case after case after case, I watched as teachers prepared and, and pre I'm sorry, and provided that loving, caring relationship for students. So Teacher Va, can you share a little bit about how you connect with your students? Thank you, so my doctor. So, uh, you know, the way that I make connection with my student, it is, uh, the first way is, you know, to, to visit their family. So especially I do this uh, at the beginning of the school years. So example, like if, uh, my, if I have like 45 students come to my class, I have to visit all of that family, you know, all of their family. So I, I visit them to make sure that I, uh, to make sure that I get some information from their family. Also, uh, I, 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 I know that where they live. So this is the way that to make sure that uh, it's easy for me to, uh, to find them when uh, they absent in school or in class, you know. And another one is uh, playing games and or having, you know, conversation during the break time. Actually, uh, for, uh, for the uh, primary school students, mostly they have like 10 minutes of break, uh, 10 minutes break time. So during that time, it is the best way to practice, uh, to, to make sure that we, we make them feel connected with us. So I usually talk with them, especially those who are quiet. So I talk to them and sometimes even play with them, you know. This is the way that I have you know, I, I have to do and also make them feel connected to me and believe in me. Another one is, you know, I could work with them uh, after school as well. So doing like this, I could raise one example about recently because uh, last year uh, the school is closed and every teacher, they, you know, they, they cannot teach uh, in school. So they have to go to the parents' house, you know, to uh, to, to make sure that they, they teach a student there. So they gather a student in, in group, like four or five of them, and then they teach together at, you know, at their house. So this is the way that even though we cannot teach them in school, we still be able to help them, you know, to, to go to their house and teach them over there. Because uh, last year, as I remember, uh, for the online learning, it is very challenging in Cambodia because it, it really used to Cambodia context. Yes, and another one is uh, helping them meet basic needs. This one is important as well to make sure that they, they feel connected with others. For example, you know, one of my students last year, uh, he, he, he didn't have a, a school uniform. So, you know, that is something that he needs, you know, and then I bought him a school uniform and he felt like, you know, feel really connected to me, feel like me and, after that, he, you know, he came to school every day. So this is something that uh, about the connection. So in the uh, to to connect with students, there are many ways for Canadian context. So thank you, Doctor. Yeah. So I think um, for anyone that's in the U.S. context or the United States, that um, so Teacher Va, I don't think realizes just exactly how um, amazing it is that teachers. First of all, visit all of their students. And I'd like to remind you that his primary school classroom, a typical classroom, can be 40 to 60 students. Um, so they have really large class size. And across the board, though, teachers visit their fam students' families. Um, when I was there, 
Um, again, remember I have my um, US perspective. And so I was observing in teacher Vaz's class and a student had a toothache. And so teacher Vaz said, oh no, no, don't worry, stay here. Um, I'll be right back. And he took the student home on the back of his motorcycle and uh, was back before we knew it. But uh, for me, that was, um, I've just never seen anything like that, right? It, it's this amazing amount of community caretaking that happens, um, the home visits, the connecting with students and really being sort of that parental figure in so many ways. In the Floating Village, one of our Teacher Leader Academy members, actually he's pictured um, here, he's, uh, he teaches the students that are this age, yet years and years later, he continues those caring connections um, because he's right now working with students who are in ninth grade, um, helping them with math. And so this is not just a one-time connection, but it's, it lasts for a really long time. I know Teacher Va as well, where he first started teaching in his home village, that um, those students were fifth graders and now they're 10th graders, but he's still in touch with them and he's still helping them. And so um, this way of just making connections and doing whatever we can when we think about teacher efficacy and what a difference it makes when a teacher believes in a student and will do whatever it takes to help them be successful. I saw this over and over in Cambodia. And I think it's a lesson that we all can learn from Cambodia. So finally, we want to talk briefly about how those school influence factors kind of fit in with the CASEL framework. So many of us, I think, are familiar with the CASEL framework. It is a social and emotional learning framework. And there are kind of five key um, competency areas, self-awareness, self-management, responsible decision-making, relationship skills, and social awareness. And all of that is within a context of classrooms and schools and homes and communities. And we think about it in terms of um, specific uh, targeted SEL instruction, but also our school-wide practices and policies, and then our family and community partnerships. And so when we think about the CASEL framework, I would love for you to pop in the chat, um, thinking about those five competency areas in the CASEL framework, where do you see the school influence factors fitting in? <laughs> Rhonda has written everywhere. And that's that's great because actually when teacher Va and I were talking, um, absolutely, you know, we were saying like, so self-management, well, that's sort of the control piece, right? Self-awareness is um, this idea that competence leads to confidence. Relationship skills and social awareness, well, we get that when we focus on contribution. And then when we think about connection, and I consider just how the, the teachers that we've observed how they connect with students and all the different areas that they impact. It truly is that they develop all five of those competency areas in everything that they do. So um, Rhonda says everywhere, and I have to say that's really what we came up with as well when we were just kind of talking about um, where we might see some of these um, school influence factors within the context of this framework. So um, we wanna say thank you so much for joining us today. And we would love to welcome your questions and your wonderings and um, hear what you have to say and what you think. Awesome. Yeah, um, everyone go ahead and drop any questions you have now in the chat. I did see one uh, from Rhonda earlier, if you uh, wanna go ahead and open up the chat. Uh, how can we replicate these experiences for middle and high school students and their teachers in the US? I think that's a great question. Um, I've thought about that a lot. So in my role as I'm a pre-K through 12 director of learning. And so when I came back from Cambodia and as I've continued to do all of this work um, virtually with our teachers there, and I just see this amazing outpouring of um, just, connection. I, I can't necessarily say that I, you know, I can't ask teachers that I work with to do that, but I certainly from my own perspective have started to look for ways to connect. And I, I think that that's critically important, especially during this time of COVID-19. Um, 
we've seen many different ways. I will say actually, even in my own district, I've seen teachers go above and beyond to try to connect with families. I think that it was um, in some ways an opportunity for us to look again at some of the ways that we interact with families and think about how we can do some outreach. So I had teachers in my own district who went to driveways in order to teach lessons. And um, before I'd really only seen that in Cambodia, right? I'd seen our teacher leader academy members going out on boats to teach kids in the middle of the, the river or to go to their homes. Um, but during COVID-19, I, I saw teachers in my own district doing something very similar. Mm. So let's see. How do we foster more community involvement in schools? That's also a great question. Um, I'm not sure that we see that as much in the Cambodian context. Um, Teacher Vaad, is that something, mm, yeah, good. Is that something that you would like to, to talk a little bit about as far as how do you involve your local community in your schools? Okay, thank you so much, Doctor. So I would like to talk about this as well. You know, because in, in, uh, in Cambodian school, we have a kinds of uh, community members. So they have to be a part of school, okay? So everything that every, or uh, I mean, every in, information about school, they, the teachers have to contribute those uh, information to the, uh, to the communities. So the communities know. For example, uh, if a school in Cambodia, you know, like if you want to build a building school in Cambodia, we might ask for help from the people or from the villagers who live in that communities. So this is a kind of asking them for contribution by money or helping, you know. So this is the way that we, we, we can do in the Cambodian context, yes. So you don't have the same kind of like, we pay school taxes in order to, to, to keep our schools up and running, but you don't have that um, we in your- We can do, yes. You have that as well? Yes, because the school is uh, paid by government, so we, we don't pay the test for school, yes. Mm, awesome. Okay, so um, Rosa says, in your opinion, how could you improve relations between families and school to gain a good compromise for the students? So I think that in both contexts, whether we're in the US or in Cambodia, um, we're always looking for ways to connect with families and to help them understand kind of um, that we're all on the same team and we're doing our very best to try to help students um, and help their children. So some of the ways that we might think about um, involving families, uh, let, maybe from the Cambodian context first, is helping them understand the value of education, helping them see that um, there is a world beyond for example, the floating village. Um, I've had a lot of conversations recently with students in Cambodia who, um, girls especially, who desperately want to go to high school, but uh, their families right now are, um, they don't see the value in a high school education. They, they think that, um, that they, they want their daughters to stay home instead. And so students are trying to navigate these conversations um, I'm happy to say that actually their teachers are helping them have those conversations with families. So it's it's a different level of involvement that I'm that I'm used to, um, but it's also very um, heartening in many ways to see that. So I think that when we think about how we can connect the school with families, it's all about really being open and listening to their needs, and then finding ways to be responsive. That's to me, that's the best way to do that. Um, so Lauren says, um, she's from England. Her favorite teacher was from Thailand. And she's saying she went above and beyond, um, focused on creating that connection. And it made such a difference because they, the students were always looking forward to the class and it was her dedication that really inspired them. I love that. Um, mm. So Heather is saying that to share some of her local wins, they had great success with an annual, annual summer community barbecue. 
They invited members of the community to participate in the school. Um, and then they would um, have people from that reach out to volunteer regularly. Mm. And then they also have community members come in. So I, yes, I think that's another great way. Um, Great, and so we have some beginners, so people who are kind of just starting out um, in their education career. So we're really happy that you were able to join us and, um, and be part of our conversation today. If you have any other questions, please feel free to put those in the chat. Okay, uh, it looks like uh, that's all the questions for today, unless there's any more that pop up later. But um, thank you so much speakers for coming and thank you everyone else for, that's in the audience for taking your time to come to this talk. Um, we at the SF Bay Area School Counselors and Education Professionals uh, Meetup Group, we hold these talks to keep people informed on different news or perspectives from our field and we're really excited about this talk to keep people furthering their learning about different places all over the world. If you haven't already, please make sure to join our Meetup Group. I'm going to put the link in the chat below. And also, uh, please come out for our next speaking event, which is going to be on next Monday with Jamal Maxim. That's April 5th. Thanks, everyone, and have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.